This morning's sermon is our relationship with unbelievers. The text is Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Before we do that, um, it's Communion Sunday. And uh, before we talk about us being the salt, the light of the world and reaching out, it is fitting for us to go to the Lord's table and be reminded of the reason why we are salt and light. The only reason, the only way we can be salt and light in the world is by what Christ has done for us, that he has wrapped us in his righteousness. He has covered our sin. He has paid for our sin on the cross, legally declaring us righteous before holy, almighty God. And so we come to the Lord's table this morning. When I say table, I think of this table, but really it is all of us together collectively remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross as he shed his blood for our sins. And I, I, my favorite text in this is really Paul, and as he teaches it in the church in 1 Corinthians 11, of course you have the gospels, you have Jesus uh, teaching his disciples what the Passover uh, represented, and that was him, and that this is now the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. He gives them the wine. He gives them the bread. And then uh, later on, Paul is instructing the church as they continue to take communion together, and it's clear that this was what the church did from the very beginning. And yet, isn't it interesting how so easily we just kind of go through religious ceremony and go through the motions and take for granted what Christ has done for us. And that's what was happening in 1 Corinthians 11, where there were divisions and human frailty and sinfulness starts to erode away at the unity of the church and so sandwiched between Paul's instruction on not uh, giving precedent to people who have more and some people getting uh, drunk even and other people not having anything and just the problems that were going on in the church, he then says uh, at the end of this communion, he says, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So whenever we take communion, we want to examine ourselves. We want to take some time and say, Lord, is there anything, anything that I need to just give to you this morning? Um, any, any sin in my life, any issue that I need to give to you? It's so easy for things to come up, sin to come up, pride. I know that it's easy for me when I see the problems in the world, when I think of being a light and being salt in the world, I think of the problems in the world and, and I get frustrated and I get some righteous anger over the problems in this world. And then I have to come back to my place of identity in Christ that I'm no better than the world, only by what Christ has done in my life am I able to be the salt and be the light and be the answer not by anything I have done. So I don't know what it may be for you, but I want to give you just some time to examine your heart before you remember our Lord's sacrifice. And as you look at that little cup, um, it should be right there in your pew or under your seat. Um, and as you look at that cup, just think to yourself what it represents. Do you know what that represents? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he is your righteousness, that he has paid for all of your sin, and it is by his blood that you can have a reconciled relationship with God? And if that's the case, let him cleanse you anew with anything that might be between you and him this morning or between you and someone else. So let us just have a moment of silence and prayer before we partake of communion. Just bow your heads and close your eyes and talk to the Lord this morning. Thank you.
Lord Jesus, you say here in your word through the apostle Paul, breathed out through him to your church for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim your death until you return. So Lord, we do, we preach the cross, we preach Christ, you the savior crucified. Lord, a stumbling block for the Jew and folly to the Gentile. Oh, but Lord, to those who have ears to hear, it is salvation. It is the power of the gospel for salvation to everyone who believes. So Lord, we are not ashamed of the gospel. It is the answer for the world today. And it is the answer for our own lostness is the answer for even our relationships with people as we seek to forgive and seek to restore just as you did with us. We thank you, Jesus, for your great sacrifice on the cross for our sins. In your name, amen. So if you take that little bread there on the top, Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16 this morning as we continue our series on relationships. Next Sunday, I'm excited to talk about uh, romantic relationships, husband, wife, maybe some of you in a dating relationship, engaged, and that connects a lot with what we're talking about this morning because um, those relationships are supposed to be a picture of God's love for us. And uh, that is really a huge way in how we shine out the light of Christ. So this morning, Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, we're going to focus on, of course, salt and then light. First, salt and the effects of salt. When I think of salt, I mainly think today of its taste, its taste on food and that it brings flavor to food. And, you know, you could go that way with salt because and how it applies to us today, because we're supposed to be filled with joy and the fruits of the spirit. And we're supposed to bring that into the world. And so we are a flavor. We're, we're good for the world. And, and yet that is actually not really what Paul is talking about here. And that is not how the first century believer would have understood salt. Uh, because the main use for salt in the ancient world was a preservative of food. It was like your refrigerator. It was a must. I don't know if you've ever had your refrigerator go out, but when it does, you got to replace it quick, right? You just can't go without a refrigerator. It's, it's a necessity today. Salt was a necessity. I love this uh, um, 
commentator Craig uh, Blumberg in the New American Commentary, what he says here, he says, the phrase loses its saltiness, reads more literally, is defiled. That is not the scientifically, or this is not the scientifically impossible notion of salt becoming flavorless, but rather the common problem in the ancient world of salt being mixed with various impure substances and therefore becoming worthless as a preservative. In fact, if you look up this um, phrase, lose its saltiness, and, and how it's translated here, uh, if you look that word up, it's actually one word that is now translated lose its saltiness. And uh, Craig Blumberg here says that it is best translated as defiled. Anytime this Greek word is used in the New Testament, it's used for foolishness. The same word would be translated as foolishness. So it could read, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has becomes foolish how shall its saltiness be restored? Which is a hard thing to wrap your mind around. It becomes foolish. How does salt become foolish? Well, defiled. So the first century believer would have heard that. Defiled, corrupt. Like you're supposed to be the light. You're supposed to be what's good for the world and a preservative. And, and because of of just trying to be like the world or, or be too much um, just like your, your friends who don't know Christ, you end up just becoming just like them and it's just bland and you really lose your whole point for living as a believer. And so then it's just to be trampled on. And, and during that time, the idea of salt being just thrown out and trampled on is, would be absolutely unheard of. If we spill a little salt, you know the whole phrase, you throw it over your shoulder, right? You know, throw it over your shoulder. If we spill a little salt, it's not that big of a deal. Back then, the salt was so needed and so valuable that that was just like a big deal. You don't want to waste any salt. It's like today, you don't want to waste any gas, right? I don't know about you guys, but I'm like at the pump, you know, and when it's done and that thing clicks, I'm like taking the hose up and <laughs> getting every little drop in there, right? Well, salt was probably more, way more valuable than, than even fuel. It was, it, it was extremely valuable. And that's what he's saying. He says, you're valuable. You're the salt of the world. You are to preserve the world. And the question would be, why does the world need preserving? Because... The world is decaying. The world is decaying. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 4. If you want to, you can turn with me there and then kind of go back here to Matthew. But I'm going to read some verses here. It speaks of the last days. And many have asked today, throughout my life, I haven't seen people asking if we're getting closer to the end times more than I have of recent it seems to be something constantly on people's minds. In fact, when Gary Mosley spoke um, in the park at, during our park outreach, they were just soaking this up as he talked about the end times. I think people are, they're seeing what's going on in the world and they're like, there's a lot of issues, a lot of problems. And as us as believers, we really should be hyper vigilant to what is going on in the world. We shouldn't be ignorant of the times. Check out what Paul says to Timothy here in 2 Timothy 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Wow. And then he says, avoid such people. 
don't get close with such people because why? We have this sin nature still inside of us that Paul talks about in Romans 7 where it is warring against what God is doing in our life and our sanctification. So if we're tight with people who are unbelievers and that live this way, it starts to affect us. This doesn't mean that we, that, that we don't care about them, that we don't pray for them, we don't try to reach them. But just as Christ reached the world and reached the lost and reached sinners, he also had his inner circle and those are the ones he spent the most time with and his disciples, those who are about following him. And so it is extremely important that we surround ourselves with people that will help us grow closer to Christ and yet still reach out to this lost world and be that salt and that light. So the world is decaying and it is of the utmost importance that we are genuine with our love for the world. I can't wait till I get to Romans 12. Romans 12, when we get back into our study of Romans, is my, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's hard for me to say it's my favorite because there's so many awesome ones. Uh, Romans 8's amazing. There's just so many. But Romans 12, I love where he, he goes from like your, the theology of being saved and the gospel and, and, and defense of the gospel. Really, all those first 11 chapters are like a defense of the gospel. And he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of the mercies of God, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your act of worship. And don't be confused to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then he goes on to say, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. You see, church, that is the salt that we are to be. We we, we, we just want to run from evil and we want to hold fast to what is good and true. And we want our love to be a love that is genuine and not hypocritical. And that all goes back to the gospel consistently, constantly to the gospel, constantly what Christ has done for us. So we're abiding in him and we're being the salt of the earth because the world is decaying. This week I read two different articles that I thought I would share a little bit with you this morning. As I see the world decaying and I think of 2 Timothy 3 and I'm like, oh, it's, it's happening. It's just happening. And it seems to be just rapidly spinning more and more out of control. In fact, uh, one of you sent me this article about what is being taught in the Evanston Skokie School District and church, this is coming for us. It's coming for us. It's coming for our school districts. I see it happening. And, it, and, and it's just getting more. And the more that, that it's taught and, and, and it's allowed, the more it's going to snowball into something much bigger and out of control. And we're all going to go, how did we get to this place? Check out some of the things that are being taught in Evanston, Skokie, school district. Kids are told that white European colonizers imposed their Western and Christian ideological framework on racial minorities and forced two-spirit people to conform to the gender binary. The teacher tells students that many people feel like they aren't really a boy or a girl. This is third grade. And that they should call people by the gender they have in their heart. Students are encouraged to break the binary, reject the system of whiteness, and study photographs of black men in dresses and a man wearing lipstick and long earrings. It is a myth, quote, it is a myth that gender is binary, the lesson explains. Even though we are all given a sex assigned at birth, you are not given your gender. Only you can know your gender and how you feel inside. At the end of the lesson, students are instructed to write a letter to the future and how they can change society. Guys, that's scary stuff. That's scary stuff. Notice how they're very strategic and how they amalgamate race 
and sexual preference and gender dysphoria, all of them kind of merge together because they know that racial injustice is a shame of our past and nobody wants to be, you know, called a racist. And so they merge us all together so you, you just can't speak against it or, or else you're like racist or you're a bigot when this is an absolute tragedy because uh, the color of your skin is a complete different issue than your feeling that you might be a boy or a girl. Complete different issue. And this is what is being caught, taught in our schools. I was talking to uh, uh, Mark Boyd, missionary in Germany, last night. He talked about how um, Germany sometimes gets this, uh, um, this stereotype that they are, this label that they're all oh, those, those Nazis, they won't care for the Syrians, they won't care for people because, you know, they're Nazis. And so when Syria was going through all this the, the war and, and all these people that were in, in camps. Germany decided we're going to, the politicians decided we're going to tell everybody, show everybody that we care for the Syrians and we're not Nazis. And so they brought all of them in with no plan whatsoever. And now they're like in like camps in Germany where they're, they're enforcing uh, uh, their own laws and, and so now they're like marrying like old men or marrying 16 year olds and it's just an absolute disaster. And there's terrorism that's going on constantly, but the, the news kind of downplays it, he says, because they don't, they don't want to send that picture that they really made such a bad mistake. And why do I share that? Because it's like, we don't want, we messed up in the past so we don't, we don't want to look like that. So we're going to just, we're just going to do that. It's a human way, do this. It's a human way of dealing with the problems that exist. And like I've always said, humanism and human politics and human systems will fail without the gospel. They will fail and they will fail royally. And that is why 2 Timothy says it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And so we see this happening in our own culture and spinning out of control. And church, you need to know what's going on, especially you parents. You need to know what's coming at your schools. Don't go silent on these issues. Be prepared to defend truth in the public square. I read another uh, article about Christianity's uh, relationship with secular society. And it was by a guy named Aaron Wren, the founder of the American Reformer. And very interesting study. He says that he breaks it down into three eras of Christianity's relationship with secular culture. The first era is the positive era. The second era is the neutral era. The positive era goes all the way up to 1994, and he has a lot of reasons with the urbanization of America that was happening at the time, and he, it's, it's a long story. But 1994 and, and before that were like the positive era where it was a positive thing to be a Christian in America. In fact, if you weren't a Christian, it could possibly hurt you socially, so it was good to be a Christian. The danger with that is that you had a lot of people probably being Christians just because it benefited them socially rather than they just really knew Jesus. So he said that was the positive era. Then you had the neutral era where it was like, yeah, just do you. It's not really positive. It's not negative. And that went up to about 2014. And now we're in the negative era where it is actually a negative thing to be a Christian because your beliefs are a threat to what is being taught in the schools. Your beliefs are are grotesque to the world. And that is where we're at today. There's different strategies. During the positive era, the strategy was coming out of the 50s, that was kind of the height of the positive era. And then coming out of the 50s, you have the 60s and the sexual revolution and all that went along with that. And the church was like, okay, we're not gonna lose this battle. We're gonna win the culture war. And so they were very aggressive and oppositional towards the world. And so that's where you came, the moral majority came about. 
It's like we're going to stand for morals. And it was very political in a lot of ways. And so then after that, when you get into more of the neutral uh, uh, era, Christians more lean towards seeker sensitive. We're not going to, we, we still want to draw a large crowd just like they did. And so we're going to just try to like not make a big deal over issues like abortion or even today LGBTQ. We want to just talk about how much Jesus loves people. And that's what we're going to focus on. And so we're not going to focus on anything that might be controversial. We're going to be seeker sensitive. And now today he says, it's really unsure how Christians are responding to the negative era. And I would say that something that is becoming increasingly popular is the term deconstruction, which is we'll deconstruct our faith because we're so offensive to the world in some of these areas that we're going to change our faith to fit with the world so that we can still, what? Reach a large crowd and have influence. Church, you know how we reach the world? We do it just as Jesus did it. Grace and truth. John 1, the apostle John, he says, Moses came, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. Jesus came with grace and truth. So I, I want to I always ask myself how I can bring grace and truth into every situation, in every situation. You see, because there were some good things that happened during the positive era, that they stood for truth. That was good. But sometimes in a very self-righteous, prideful way, with the wrong motive of wanting to be the dominant force in society. And guess what? It didn't work in the long run. They're not, we're not the dominant force. And then to go seeker sensitive and not talk about hot topic issues that are clearly talked about in the Bible is not good either, but maybe they were a little more graceful and listening and understanding. And there's some good with that. I've heard the best way to share Christ with somebody is first seek to understand and then seek to be understood. First, make sure that you're understanding that person well. Maybe even when they're sharing their opinion on something, share back to them, say back to them what their belief is and make sure you represent it in such a way that they can say, I couldn't have said it any better myself. And then, and then look for a way to share truth and look to build the bridge of relationship that bears that weight of truth, that you're able to share truth with that person. I want you to think about where you stand on grace and truth. Some of us tend to be more graceful, more seeker sensitive, more understanding, more loving, more kind, more, and that's a great thing. And then some of us tend to be more focused on truth and justice and this is wrong in our society. And it's it, this stuff that I just read that's going on in Evanston and Skokie and is starting to filter down and they want to take over everything is it, it, child abuse. It's just straight up child abuse. This is an injustice, a major injustice. And I'm seeing it play out with young kids talking to teachers and hearing about what's going on and how confused these kids are. And they will try to change their gender to get this person to like them. And then they don't, then they go back. It is a disaster. Maybe you're more focused on truth and you see this and you're like, oh, I got to do something about it. Where are you? If you're more focused on truth, if that's more you, that defines you more, you need to focus on grace. That's me. I'll be flat out honest. I'm more on justice. When I see something wrong, I want to fix it. It upsets me. And I have to remember, and the Lord constantly does this to me. And I'm telling you, I don't always do it perfectly, but I need to constantly go back to, it is only by grace that I have been saved. People need the Lord. And, and, and I've been given this great gift, this salvation, this reconciliation with God Almighty. 
and it's nothing I've done. So these people that are living this way and buying into this crazy ideology, this crazy way of life and thinking that this is good, they just are lost. And I need to have the heart of Christ that they're like sheep without a shepherd. And my heart breaks for them. And those of you who are grace focused and more, you know, you want to be friends with everybody. Remember that really to truly help people, you need to speak truth. So, so let God do that. Like, let God get you a little uncomfortable. Be more truthful. Be ready to stand for injustice, especially when it comes to those that are outside of your household. Because I've heard this say before by people, well, my kids are out of the system, so my kids aren't in elementary grade anymore, so I guess I'm good. No, you're not. As believers, no, you're not. You're to be salt and light. You're to stand for truth because those are somebody else's kids. And in fact, I'm not too worried about my kids going liberal on some of this stuff. In fact, they're usually a little too like far the other way like me. You know, and I'm like, okay, temper that down a little bit, right? So I'm not worried about that, but I am concerned about the other kids out there that don't have, they're not here in the pews. They're not hearing this stuff. They're not being raised in a Christian home and they're just being fed to the wolves. That is what is so sad for me. And they're being told that whatever they feel like doing is a good thing. And the enemy is what? Christian whiteness? Man, it's going to get, that soil is getting harder and harder and harder to share the gospel in America. It's just getting more and more difficult. And that's my real concern because that's the real issue. That's what they need. They need Jesus. And all of this is a satanic attack. And there may be some little truth in it here and there. A lot of times it's like under the guise of bullying, anti-bullying. I'm all for anti-bullying. But kids get bullied for a lot of things. In fact, you know, I got bullied for being a Christian most of the time. My kids get bullied for that. So people get bullied for a lot of things. Let's talk about that. So there's some truth in there, but mixed with all kinds of satanic lies that are pulling our culture down. And church, we are to be the preservative in this world. So do it. Be the salt. Be who God created you to be. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Salt changes whatever it lands on. And it's either it lands on food and it preserves it and it gives it flavor or it lands on your car and it corrodes it. And I think of it like this, some people that you share the truth with, even if you do it with grace, they're going to hate you for it. It's going to corrode. They're going to be repulsed by that. And you know what? You did exactly what God called you to do. So sleep well. You did exactly what God called you to do. We can't be just trying to gather a large crowd. We're going to dumb down the truth so we can get a large crowd. Jesus said, narrow is the gate. 2 Timothy 3 says it's going to get worse. So I shouldn't be shocked when people are increasingly turning away from God and turning away from truth and I shouldn't be shocked when people who are unbelievers believe crazy stuff like this because they don't know what truth is. But should I be okay with it? No. It should upset something deep inside of me because, because I've been given the light and I want others to have that light. And so I'm going to keep shining against that darkness. Let's keep shining no matter how many people come and follow. Let's just be who God called us to be for his glory for first and foremost. So secondly, secondly, the text says to be the light. Before, actually, I, I, I skipped one, one uh, point here. And that is, it's not to be trampled on. Salt is not to be trampled on. Okay, so what's this all about? Well, I talked about how salt is, it, it would be un, unheard of for salt to be just cast out and trampled on. And, and, and church, it is a travesty when, when we are 
are not being who God called us to be. We're either hypocritical, we're prideful, we're cocky. Maybe like somewhere during the moral majority time, there's a lot of self-righteousness. We're the majority, we're gonna win, we're gonna have all this power over the world. They're on the outside, we're on the inside. We're the righteous ones, they're the fallen ones. Rather than having a heart of compassion for them, and, and by the way, that wasn't everybody. There was many people that had a real compassion for the lost and saw what was wrong. So there's kind of some crossover. But then the other side, the seeker-sensitive side, where we, where we just kind of dumb down the truth, you know what happens? We get trampled on because we're not really being who we're supposed to be. I, I can think of, for me, a lot of it was I was prideful. I didn't really care about the lost when I was in high school, I was more threatened by them. I was more prideful and I really didn't uh, obsess over reaching my peers until later on when I saw the devastation of th their beliefs and I realized how good I had it and my faith started to grow. And I got to the point where I just had this, 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 this strong confidence in what I believed was true. And so when I took that year off of college and worked at the steel factory, at that time in my life, I was strong and I stood for what I believed in. And it was a great time in my life because, because I, I didn't let it get me upset. I just knew that what I believed was true. And so I didn't get trampled on. But a lot of times growing up, I just got trampled on. I was afraid to talk about it. And, and the world sees that and they go, oh, they don't even talk about it. They don't even tell us about Jesus. So it must be a joke. And they trample all over it. It's like, it's like a joke to them. I've heard an atheist say that Christians, if they really believe what they believe, they should be sharing it, but they don't. So it must not be true. Wow. And so the goodness that we have gets trampled on by the world. When I, when I read this, it made me think of that flag. Have you guys seen that flag, don't tread on me? In fact, I think we might have that on the PowerPoint. Can we put that up? See that flag? I, you know, I never know what to think about this flag because it's like, sometimes I feel like it's like these mean dude, you know? It's like, oh, that dude's mean, you know? But you know what? If you look into the history of it, because I thought, don't tread on me, don't, don't be trampled on, don't tread on me. We're supposed to stand. We're supposed to be assertive with our faith. I was like, I had to look into the history of this. Didn't know this about this flag. Uh, it actually comes from the American Revolution and Benjamin Franklin was quoted as saying that the rattlesnake does not back down. You know, if you try to trample it, it's going to strike, you know. And so it was a flag that was used uh, during, uh, uh, it was actually flown on uh, in 1775 as a battle cry for American independence from British rule. So that's really what it, what it was about. I thought that was, that was really interesting to know. Um, of course, I think the flag has been used for, you know, the right left drama and all that, and probably um, is, is uh, looked down on by people, but it's a good truth to that. We shouldn't back down. As believers, we should be not afraid of what the world throws against us. We are in a battle, a war, and we are not to back down with our faith. We are to be assertive. We are to be strong and confident and do it with love and grace, both grace and truth. So let us not be trampled on by the world. Expect persecution. Expect persecution. You're going to have it. In fact, before the salt and light passage, Jesus says in verse 11, the verse right before it, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're blessed when you're persecuted. When you're standing for truth, there are gonna be people that don't like you. If you, if you, even if you do it in the most gracious, loving way, in fact, sometimes if you do it in the gracious, most loving way, they hate you even more because people actually listen to you. If you do it real mean, they're like, yeah, nobody's gonna listen to that guy. But if you're doing it with grace and humility and love and you're standing for truth, people are going to hate that and they're gonna wanna persecute you and they're gonna wanna come at you. 
but be confident it will not break you. It will not trample on you. The scriptures make that clear. Jesus says, I've overcome. Don't be afraid. Stand for the gospel. Stand for Christ in the midst of some of the greatest persecution. Those are all my heroes of the faith. Whose are yours? My heroes are those that didn't live during the easiest times. They were ones that lived during the hard times. And they stood for their faith in a way that shined out the light of Christ and, and had a massive impact on the world in which they lived. So do that. Shine out the light of Christ. I like this quote from um, uh, Greg Blomgren again in the New American Commentary. He says this, in light of the countercultural perspectives enunciated in the Beatitudes, the blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and then those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He's speaking of that in the Beatitudes. It would be easy to assume that Jesus was calling his followers to a separatistic or quasi-monastic, monastic meaning like a monk, where you just remove yourself away from society and, and, and you separate. Here, Jesus proclaims precisely the opposite. Christians must permeate society as agents of redemption. Of the numerous things to which salt could refer to in antiquity, its use as a preservative in food was probably its most basic function. Jesus thus calls his disciples to arrest corruption and prevent moral decay in their world. During the New Testament, before Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave and, and the Gentiles were just coming in to the church in hordes, even before that and in the Old Testament as well, there would be Gentiles who would start worshiping Yahweh and start worshiping the Lord and become part of the Jewish community. They were called Gentile proselytes and they were, they were drawn to Judaism. Why were they drawn to it? Because, and everything I've read on this, they were always drawn because of the moral decay that they saw in the Gentile world that did not have any law or moral standard from God and it was just chaos. And so then they became Jewish. Because they're like, these guys are the light. And so church, as we shine out the light of Christ, and we should fight for moral decay in our culture. I've heard Christians say, no, let's just focus on, on Jesus, the gospel. The gospel speaks to moral decay. You can't understand the gospel uh, unless you understand that you're a sinner, right? So we need to speak to these issues. And what will happen is it will, it will corrode for some people and other people, it will preserve them. And they will come running to the gospel because they need Jesus and they've been searching and now you've given them the answer. Lastly, the light of the world. Notice specifically what, what Jesus says about being the light of the world. He says, in the same way, just as light shines out bright, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How do we let our light shine? Good works. Good works. Be intentional and aware of your light shining. Be intentional about your light shining into the world. Light is something that everyone is drawn to. Good works is something that everyone is drawn to. So salt, preserve, and then also let your light shine. Fourth of July is coming up. Everybody enjoys fireworks. We enjoy looking at a fire and seeing those blue and red flames. It's beautiful. And so we're supposed to proclaim the gospel through our works, through how we love people. And people will see that and go, there's something that they got that I want. In fact, um, I have a, cousin whose wife is a strong atheist. And when I was visiting his house, there was all these books about atheism and all of them against, it's funny that the atheists are against Christianity. They don't really go against like Islam. It's against Christianity. I really believe it's because we're the truth. Like that, that's it. 
The, the, Islam, eh, Christianity. I've got to attack Christian. If I can shut them down, then I can convince myself that God really, really isn't real. They're suppressing that. And so she suppresses that. She spends a lot of study and energy doing that. And yet she has made comments. She doesn't like Christians, but she has made comments to my aunt about how she loves that we serve the homeless. And we should, not just the homeless, but people in the park, people in our community that are needy. She sees that and she goes, wow, that, that's cool. And I'm like, and I was able to have a good conversation with her, even though she knew I was a pastor. She knows that I care about the poor. And that is a light that even she can appreciate. And so let our light shine before men so that when they say, oh, all you care about is, is life before uh, birth, we can say, no, 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 we don't. We do this, we do that, because Jesus told us to do these things. Not because we're better than you, but Jesus did these things, and he told us to do these things. He was the perfect man. No one else comes close. And so we do these good works intentionally so that people will see it. And I'm going to tell you, park ministry people, thank you so much for all the work you do. Donna, I wish she was here. I was planning on, uh, on uh, um, praising her this morning. Donna, you guys... Donna does so much. I, she has a patience like that challenges me. Her patience for people and the stuff she has put up with over the years with loving people, it's like, wow. You know, like that is amazing. I think that is the light of Christ in her. And I know where it comes from. It comes from Jesus, her love for her Savior. So whatever your thing is, whatever you do, those of you who serve even in our church, and especially those of you who serve with children every Sunday, you know, I talked to Sheila about that throughout the week and how it went with children's church and everything. That's a light. It's a light to even our church. Serve, love people, let your good works be seen, not to pat yourself on the back, but to show I have an awesome God and he's worthy of my service. He's worthy of, of me giving of myself because of all that he has done for me. So may we be that light. May the world see that light and, and it put a little seed in their heart so that when they're going through a tough time, they go, I need to go talk to Holly. I need to go talk to Loria. I need to go talk to Shelby. I need to talk to Bridget. I need to talk to that person because they, they have something in them that I need and I want. And we know that it's Jesus. Let us close in prayer. Oh, Father, we just, uh, we just pray that you would help us be this light and be this salt. And we ask for you to have your way. Amen. I forgot to do one thing. And that was in your bulletin, there is a option for uh, times that you would, you would be available to pray. June is coming up. It's Pride Month. And I don't know about you, but Pride Month just irritates me so bad. It's just always in our face constantly. I know what it represents. I know it represents what's being taught in these schools. And last year, the pride flag was being flown on DMH. And I just know that so many people don't really, really realize how dark that is. And, and I'm like, what can we do? You may see me wearing like the Mario, he wears this Reclaim the Rainbow shirt. I might just start wearing that like all the time. Because um, I want to be outward. But what we really need to start at is prayer. We need to pray. And our prayer group on Thursdays is minimal. We have about three people that come every week and pray, and we pray for you. During the month of June, we're going to pray for our country, our culture. We're going to pray for the gospel to go forth. So take that little insert out of your bulletin. Circle one of those times. One of the times was like early morning. One of the times was lunch break. And I think one of them was Saturday morning. There's three options there. Circle which one works best for you. And also, this is going to be a time where we teach each other how to pray as we go to the Word. We're going to use Christ's prayer to his disciples as the template. 
our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we're going to take some time and just praise the Lord. Just praise him for who he is. And then we're going to, you're going to use that as a temple. Then we'll go, your kingdom come on earth. So how do we want God's kingdom to come on earth? And so then we'll just break that down. And that's what we're going to do. And I want you to circle that. And, um, and hopefully we can see more people come. And let us just take the month of June and just pray and petition our Lord uh, to, 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 to do something, to, to impact, to use us to impact this broken, broken culture that we live in. And then you can turn it in at the back, actually. Leave it on the desk in the foyer, please, if you could do that. That would be awesome.